cities. So that was the template, and I learned so much from them. I'd like to just ask you to take a look at the cover and the table of contents for this book, and I'll walk you through it real quickly, and then I'll get to a few little readings, excerpts. This cover is actually, I think, a, just a piece of a work of genius by Jack Harrison. If anybody doesn't have them, there, there are some more copies here somewhere. Uh, Jack Harrison at the UMass Press, uh, who also did the cover of The Humane Metropolis. The, the guy is just brilliant. And we worked together on this. It was my idea to have this quartet of portraits, uh, but it was his his idea to create the the blending of the past city and the and the future city using the you know where what the top half of this rep where that was taken Chicago no? it sure was and I took that picture by the way do you know where in Chicago the this is the cloud gate at Millennium Park and these are people just miscellaneous people of all kinds and it's kind of a wonderful abstract sense of looking at into the future on their own terms rather than being <laughs> told what to do. If you flip over the card, you'll see how I went, how this book uh, became organized. I didn't start off with this plan in mind. This was not the book I started off to write. I think Barbara will probably remember. I had a Early title was called uh, Healing Cities. Mm, mm, not so great. Then my next inspiration was Urban Spring. <laughs> at the time it seemed okay, it was sort of poetic, and uh, the, the idea of, of the <coughs> grassroots, the bottom up uh, initiative and energy replacing uh, the top-down, expert-driven theme that runs throughout this book. But Urban Spring, I think, uh, lost its uh, appeal with events uh, that have been happening around the world. So we uh, finally settled on reclaiming American cities, and I suddenly discovered I'd written a historical book as much as a, a snapshot a series of snapshots of present-day urban, human, humane urbanism, as I call it. So let's just run down the uh, table of contents, and um, after the preface and introduction, a train journey into the past and future. Uh, for part one, the patrician decades up to World War II, uh, beginning roughly at the beginning of the century, really beginning with um, the Columbian Exposition of 1893, but uh, this gave me a chance to go back and <coughs> read and learn about people like Jane Addams, who was the first person on the top of the, the quartet of portraits here. Amazing. I'll come back and read you a little about her uh, from chapter two. Uh, and the clash between the people-oriented, bottom-up, uh, uh, advocates that she represented and the top-down elite establishment that the City Beautiful movement, Daniel Burnham and all of his ilk. And I realize if there are any planners in the room, I am damned to hell. I am committing heresy of the first order to, but Yes, the Chicago plan had wonderful features and elements to it, and the worst parts of it were not built, so that, that's good. But it, all, it very much represented a, 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 the, the views of the comfortable suburban class. I will come back to that. The second part of the book, um, the technocrat decades, uh, up until roughly 1990, after World War II, the era of urban renewal, interstate highways, urban sprawl, all kinds of incentives for white migration to the suburbs and keeping blacks in their place in the central inner city neighborhoods and then clearing those neighborhoods and forcing people to move into ever more crowded conditions. 
Um, chapter five, Battling the Bulldozer, uh, draws on my open lands past uh, experience. I was introduced to the Indiana Dunes battle then. I didn't participate in it. With, Connie and I used to go out to the dunes sometimes when we first knew each other. But this was an epic environmental <coughs> struggle against the forces of industry and politics of Indiana in particular. And it's the first national park, and maybe the only national park, where the sponsorship of it came from an Illinois senator and was opposed by all of the political establishment of Indiana. <coughs> uh, it's laid out there in, um, in chapter five, and I won't be reading from that here, but uh, I drew heavily on Ron Engel's book, Sacred Sands, and he's the sort of philosopher, uh, eth ethicist of, of, of the Indiana Dunes, and lives there, and has, he's a theologian. And he views the Indiana Dunes battle as a, as a struggle for democratic uh, regional planning, essentially. I won't go any further on that. Legacies of Sprawl, Witch's Brew, that was my chance to look at all the bad side of what we have built all the way up to the present time. Uh, this is still talking about the technocrat decades, but a lot of the data and so forth in that chapter are fairly current on housing and population and, and um, <clears throat> climate change and so forth. Then we move towards the more hopeful part of the book, the more humane decades. Uh, since 1990, and that's a very approximate date. Um, and this garden of acronyms, I thought that was kind of a neat term. Um, lots of, this is a fruit salad chapter. There's all kinds of things in there which you wouldn't expect. The obvious topics, smart growth, new urbanism, of course, but the Americans with Disabilities <coughs> Act, the, um, the uh, ice tea, which created or, or facilitated rail trails and greenways, um, housing financing. I learned a lot trying to write that chapter, uh, the Section 8 program and the, and the uh, low income tax housing credits, huge source of funding for um, affordable housing. It's summarized, it's not in great detail. And um, then the most enjoyable chapter of the book for me to write was the New Age Central Parks, Chapter 8. That's where this column that appeared in the Gazette that you're holding in your hands on one side of that two-sided handout uh, was based on the first part of that chapter, uh, Millennium Park and its contrast with Grant Park down the street. The other, the, the title, the subtitle, Two Grand Slams and a Single. All right, Millennium Park was certainly a grand slam. What do you think the second grand slam was? Chicago? Not in Chicago. The high, the high road. The, the high road. line, the exactly, high line. in New York City, yeah. down back in my hometown. Uh, marvelous, incredibly successful, incredibly popular um, linear park up on the former railroad viaduct. So there's a, a case study of that. And what's the single? This was a charitable term, uh, in my opinion. As I say, this is a, the work of a post-academic, a recovering academic, so I could say things as I saw them. Where do you think the single is in terms of new downtown parks? How about our own, the Rose Kennedy? Here? Exactly. You oh. get the prize. The Rose Kennedy Greenway in Boston, and I, here again, I will be boiled in oil by landscape designers from Cambridge, from MIT and Harvard, I'm sure. But it has the look of a design studio product to me. I don't know how many of you have, have visited there, but it sure doesn't live up to the hype that it was used to sell the big dig to the state by, and to the city, of course. <coughs> That was going to be the great reward. Well, it was really an add-on, in my opinion. So, moving on, then, um, waterways, reclaiming urban waterways. Um, visited various cities, uh, Boston's Charles River, which is a great success story. 
the Anacostia, which is a medium success story in, in Washington, uh, Maryland and Washington, D.C. The Buffalo Bayou in Houston, which is an up-and-coming, uh, that's a really important project for urban river restoration and the real estate along it. And the Los Angeles River. So this moved around the country quite a bit. And finally, the humane urbanism at ground level is a series of vignettes from various places as close as um, Holyoke and as far away as Portland and so forth. Uh, I I'm, I'm actually have Barbara snitch this from a doctor's office yesterday. <laughs> um, Time Magazine cover, Is and it's a... Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure she's going to return it. 2005. <laughs> Don't return it. This is a marvelous cover. It's two, whoops, two page spread. A view from the new One World Trade Center. And I read this last night and I thought, yeah, I'm going to show this because, yes, I love skyscrapers. I love tall buildings. I'm a New Yorker. But this is absolutely not what reclaiming American cities is about. I'll leave that to Edward Glazer and the proponents of the triumphant city and so forth. This is about ordinary parts of cities, ordinary people, mundane neighborhoods in many cases. Not Millennium Park is not mundane, but there are some exceptions. Um, but lots of work going on, which is sampled in Chapter 10, that you've never heard of. That it's only going on locally, it doesn't get much press. These were the kinds of projects and people we tried to contact and involve in our various conferences, Humane Metropolis and the ones before that. And just last week, I was so thrilled to hear from a gentleman in Baltimore, retired doctor. He said, we are going to, we want you to come down and talk about your new book. We're building on what you brought with you when you uh, organized the Humane Metropolis Baltimore Conference about four years ago now. And it was really good to hear that it had an impact. He sent me a watershed, a tiny watershed uh, study. The study wasn't so tiny, but it was a small urban watershed that had been uh, examined minutely and with all kinds of projects uh, to, to improve its water quality and its habitability and its humaneness in the city of Baltimore. It's really good to hear about these things. And everybody has examples in, you know, that they know about through their families or friends or whatever. But a lot of it isn't celebrated but in the planning literature. Um, okay, let's... Uh, I'm supposed to read something to you. And I won't spend too long on it. Um, because I promised to finish by 8. And I want to let you get buy some books and um, have some wine, maybe in the other order. Um, but let me, let me give you a little bit of taste of Jane Addams first. As a product of Jane Addams' powerful intellect and spirit, Hull House, this is on the southwest side of Chicago. It's a, now a National Park Service landmark, but this was the original settlement house established in 1889 by Jane Addams and her friend Ellen uh, Gates. Um, and uh, Hull House was much more than a safe, warm, and welcoming refuge from the rigors of tenement life for the newly arrived immigrants living in the neighborhood, the Halstead neighborhood, around Hull House. <clears throat> this was an old pre-Civil War mansion that somehow was built in the wrong place, I guess, near the stockyards. Everything, all the, that industry came in and the, uh, you know, the, the, all of the wretched conditions, living conditions, working conditions uh, of that era uh, were, were focused right there in the, where Hall House was, was located. Um, profoundly influenced by the writings and philosophy of Leo Tolstoy, whom she visited in Russia in 1895, Adams eschewed benevolence, uh, in quotes, which she viewed as, quote, a selfish, arrogant, and anti-democratic ethic that needed to be retired from contemporary life. 
unquote. Rather, she embraced the Tolstoy.